Now the video on moving towards San Lo, we follow the 29th and the second divisions striving to move to San Lo. On the 12th of June, the 29th division crossed the L, and then by the 18th of June, they were three quarters of the way to San Lo. The second division crossed the L further to the east. Now on the 16th of June, they were ordered to assault Hill 192, which was a vital summit before taking San Lo. And then they were put into active defence, which means stop where you are. Because all resources are going to be concentrated on Sherbourg. Now Sherbourg was taken on the 27th of June by the 9th, the 79th and the 4th Divisions. Less than a week later, the 9th Division and the 90th Division were attacking the Melman Line south of the Sherbourg Peninsula. And Montcast was taken on the 11th of July. Now at the beginning of July, the 30th Division was sent to advance on the west of the River Vere towards San Lo. And on the 11th of July, they managed to get to the Old Vent, Hill 91, where they were stopped. Now by the 11th of July, Brigadier General Bone had got to the Old Vent. He felt he could continue, but General Hobbs, who was in a rage because of what happened during the day, didn't really believe he'd got there, and he told him to stay where he was. Now the 9th Division, which had helped take Cherbourg, was now coming up on the 30th Division's right flank, and the 35th Division, which had just landed on Omar Beach, went straight into battle and was coming up on their left flank. And they were stopped at Saint-Gilles. The 11th of July was a pivotal day in the Battle of Normandy. Montcast had been taken by the 90th Division. The Old Vent had been taken by the 30th Division, even though they'd been stopped there. And it was the first day that Bradley felt that they had enough troops and weapons in place to really take on the German defences. The final thrust to Saint Lo would be carried out by the 29th Division. They'd be supported by the 2nd Division on their left flank, taking Hill 192, and the 35th Division coming along the east bank of the Via. The second division were to assault Hill 192 again. They tried on the 16th of June, a month ago, and that had failed. So they've been retraining since. Now the Germans put the Bocage to their advantage. They used the sunken lanes and barbed wire to stop intelligence gathering and to facilitate their movements through their lines. The engineers had prepared the hedges before the attack. They'd excavated halfway through the bank. When the attack started, the tank had just rammed through. Now they weren't using the hedge cutter developed by Sergeant Cullin yet, even though he demonstrated it to General Bradley on the 14th of July. Bradley wanted to keep that secret until Operation Cobra. But the Americans were using tanks with big spikes on to ram holes into the hedge bank and the engineers could put explosives in. General Gero of the 5th Corps said Hill 192 was primordial, but the 2nd Division had to go further than the summit, right up to the road from Bayard to Saint Lo, to control a 3 kilometer perimeter around the summit. We're here on Hill 192, that relates them to height in meters. You can see the importance of this hill as well as the fact that it uh, commands the approach to Saint Lo. From here they can see you right to the coast. And uh, on a fine day, from here I've seen Utah Beach. I can see Utah Beach from here because it's uh, around the bay of uh, Carentin. So you can't see Omar Beach. But you can see this from the mound in the middle of La Combe Cemetery. Over that way, we can see the Abbey of Cerisi, and behind the horizon is Bayeux. Now due to the morning mist, the air support had been cancelled. There was a 20 minute barrage laid down before they started the attack. Now the night before, the 38th Regiment had retreated a few hundred yards to protect themselves against the barrage. Now the Germans from here, they could see everything the 
Americans were doing. So they realized what that meant and they advanced 200 yards. So when the barrage went off, that missed most of the Germans. In the first half hour, the Germans put out of action six tanks of the first wave and forced a battalion to retreat. The Americans advanced relentlessly. By midday, they'd taken the summit. And then they moved even further because to hold the summit, that to go further than that. There was a German defence position near here. The Americans called it Kraut Corner. Now they'd been over there, not far away, for four weeks. And so they knew it well. During the attack, 12 riflemen surrounded it. They managed to get within grenade launcher distance and destroyed the gun here. 15 German paratroopers were taken prisoner. Three refused to surrender and they were buried by a tank dozer. This is the summit of Hill 192. They had to continue further over that way to cross the Bayer to Saint Lo Road to push the Germans off the summit. This is the Calvary Crossroad on the road from Bayer to Saint Lo. Now the second division had come up to Hill 192, which is over there, and they crossed this road so they really controlled the summit. Now this was the limit between the 29th and 2nd. The second were that way, to the east, and then the 29th were over this way. Now behind me is the road down to Van Lowe. In a car, it takes five minutes. It was going to take them a week. The 137th and the 320th regiments of the 35th Division would attack along the banks of the Via, and 115th would follow the main road from Isigny to saint Lo to make a diversionary attack and also attack Hill 122. So the 2nd Battalion, 115th Regiment, came down that lane to attack Bourg d'Enfer, which is here. It actually means Helsberg. Just a few houses. Then they were supposed to take Hill 122. Hill 122 was just north of Saint Lo, and it's that way. And from its escarpment, they had a great view onto Saint Lo. Now, the 116th would take Martinville Ridge, which is over there, then turn right and follow the ridge down into Saint Lo. Now, with Hill 122 being taken and the uh, 116th coming up in the rear of the Germans defending it, that would force the Germans to pull out. Now the 115th are just about to start their attack and they were attacked by paratroopers of the 3rd Parachute Division, 2nd Corps. But just before the attack, a German patrol had cut the American communication lines. So this caused a greater confusion. This attack could have caused the whole plan to fail but although it caused many casualties, it was suddenly called off. The paratroopers mounted this attack in support of the Panzerlehr, which was attacking American troops to the west of the Via. The 115th was completely disorganised by this attack, and it took till after midday before they could reorganise and start moving. On the 9th of July, a German medic had approached the 1st Battalion with a white flag to organise a truce to collect bodies and wounded. This mission probably doubled as intelligence gathering for their attack on the 11th. The 116th were fighting their way up this slope towards saint andre de lepine and then up to the ridge of Martinville. Their start line would probably be the hedge on the other side of those farm buildings. They come out this slope. The tactics for the taking of fields had been developed. From the near side of the first hedge, tanks would fire into the far corner of the field to eliminate machine guns. Mortars would lay down smoke shells along the edge of the field. The infantry could now advance through the centre of the field to attack the far hedge. While they were doing this, 
the tanks would ram their spike into the hedge base and the engineers would fill the holes with explosives to blow a gap. The tanks could now come up to assist the infantry. This tactic always worked but would cost casualties. The only thing that's pre-war in Saint André de Lepine there's some of those graves. It's been rebuilt. This is Martin Ville Ridge. Now once the 116th came up through Saint André de Lepine, they turned right onto this road, the 195, and this would take them down to Saint Lô. Except the advance was painfully slow. They were coming under fire from the Germans had been on Hill 192. They'd gone across to the Bar de Semele, the hills over there. And Hill 122, which is north of Saint Lô, was still in German hands. And they were being fired on from the Germans over there with their artillery. Now they'd crossed perhaps two fields in a day with taking a dozen casualties for each hedge. Now the 175th had followed the 116th up the incline and then they would move round to take the left flank of the 116th. But they were coming under fire, even more so being on the southern flank of the ridge. Uh, from Martinville Ridge, we can see La Luzerne in the middle of the frame. That's where the 115th started, over that way between the two dark trees. We can see Hill 122 that the 115th were supposed to take. And that way to the south, we can see the Bar of Semele where the Germans are firing from. And in two days of combat, the 29th Division had taken around a thousand casualties. On the 13th of July, the 175th had taken up a position facing south on the south flank of the ridge. As the 115th didn't have enough resources to take Hill 122, on the 14th of July, Hill 122 was put into the 35th Division's sector. Regiment 134 was given the mission to take it. The 137th Regiment was descending along the east bank of the Via, but then they came under fire from the Germans on top of Hill 122 and were stopped. So they couldn't advance until 122 was taken. On the 15th, Brigadier General Sebri led a combat team from 134th to Hill 122. Trenches were dug and sandbags added to prepare for the inevitable counter-attack. It came in the early hours of the 16th, but they held on. The Germans finally disappeared over the summit, and the Americans now found a great view of San Lo. The way to San Lo was now open, in theory, but it still didn't fall on the 17th. With a shorter front to contend with, the 29th Division had more chance of advancing effectively. After regrouping, the attack was relaunched on the 15th of July. The 115th Regiment was to attack down the Isigny to Saint Lô Road, which we can see over there. And the main attack would be carried out by the 116th Regiment, and the 175th would be on the southern flank of the ridge. As the attack started, the 116th lost seven tanks due to German fire coming from the Bar of Semilly, Semilly. And this fire caused the 115th to retreat a few hundred yards. And then due to bad coordination between the 35th and the 115th, there was friendly fire exchanges between them. So by the end of the day, the 116th had advanced very little. The 175th and 115th had advanced nowhere. So General Gerhardt decided to try a night attack. During this attack, two battalions of the 116th went out on a spur. They came through Martinville. 
Now fearing dispersion from the men, Colonel Cannon ordered a halt. Now one battalion stopped, but the other one didn't get the order and kept going. And they went down this lane. Now this was to become the Lost Battalion. They hadn't got the order because Major Bingham, their commander, was at the back of the group checking the supplies. And when he realised they were missing, he went out to find them. He found the telephone wire they were laying, so he followed it, picked up in his hand and just slid it through and followed it down this lane. Now that's the outskirts of St. Lowe, we can see. The 175th would be coming down that road into the town behind them. So Bingham found his men near the chapel of La Madeleine, less than a mile from the centre of St. Lowe. They'd set up positions both sides of the main road. Of course, at the time, there were just fields here and the chapel. There was the good news and there was the bad news. The good news was that they'd broken through the German defences about a mile and they were less than a mile from the centre of Saint Lô. Because the bad news was they were surrounded. The Germans fired at them but they were just really hurrying them. They could have overpowered them but the Germans probably didn't know their strength. And they had one medic with them and also picked up a German medic who's actually Austrian. In the video on the advance to San Lo, I cited part of the memoirs of a veteran called Rocco. He was in this lost battalion. He and a buddy had found a well and filled up their canteens. The next day wounded men needed water so Rocco and two others went to the well to fill up canteens. He was designated as the one to go down the ladder in the well. Rocco thought that that would be the best place if there were machine gun bullets flying around. And suddenly there were. There were three of them on the ladder in the well. When things calmed, they pushed the cigarette butts off the water and filled the canteens. They were worried about being attacked by tanks as their group had just three bazooka rockets left. On the second day, a soldier came to tell him that two of his buddies had been killed from a shell hitting a tree above them. On the 17th of July, the commander of the 3rd Battalion was sent to relieve them and then the two battalions would move on to St. Lowe. This was Major Thomas Howie. He told the men to be silent. They fixed bayonets and he told them not to engage Germans unless it was absolutely necessary. Fortunately, there was an early morning mist which shrouded their advance. Two men had been designated to use their weapons if they needed. They went the same way as Bingham and the 2nd Battalion had gone and they contacted the men at La Madeleine. Now Bowie set up a communications post and the men were digging trenches and foxholes. He contacted Colonel Dwyer and Dwyer said, are the 2nd Battalion in a state to continue to saint Lo?" And how he said, no, they're exhausted. Then Dwyer said, well, can you, the 3rd Battalion, go into San Lo on your own? How he said, will do. They were just going to get back in a foxhole and a piece of shrapnel went through his lung and a few minutes later he died. A Captain Puntony took command and he mounted an assault towards San Lo. And the Germans reacted with a hail of artillery and mortars. The men were, just couldn't move. Attacked by fighter bombers and uh, artillery screen saved the day. In the evening of the 17th, the transport column managed to reach the men, which was a great relief. Now with the 116th and 175th having taken so many casualties, General Gerhardt decided it was going to be up to the 115th to take St. Lo. General Norman Cotta formed a task force to enter the town. It's the same General Cotta who goaded the men to get off of Omar Beach and went into Isigny with the men. The 115th were to open away and Cotta's force would go in. 
The 1st Battalion, 115th, knocked out an anti-tank gun and pushed past a roadblock. Kota could now go in and found the town practically empty, but with snipers and harassing troops left. Major Glover Johns set up a communications post in a cafe by the junction, which is now where Howie's roundabout is. But there was a blue and grey flag outside and suddenly a hail of mortars came in. This flag had become a target for the German observers in town and so it became too dangerous to stay there and John's looked for another site. And this was a perfect site. It's the mausoleum of the family Blanchet. That's perfect because the, it's more or less shell proof. There's an underground crypt. Not too easy to get down. Sarcophagus that they could use as a table for their maps. And there were some bottles of wine here, so the Germans have been using it before. Communications were soon set up. Any counter-attack could be warded off by well-placed artillery directed by the forward observers. Lieutenant Cooper and Captain Ellie Gifford saw that the towers of Notre Dame would make good observation posts. They climbed this spiral staircase and as the top was missing had to finish by climbing a rope. They had a magnificent view of the south out of San Lo. After coming down they found two artillery observers and instructed them to set up a post on the tower. Before the artillery men could do anything the tower collapsed. They weren't put off, they used the other tower, the one that's still there. The body of Major Howie was brought into San Lo on the morning of the 19th of July. It was laid to rest on the rubble of the clock tower of St. Quad Church. Major Howie became a symbol of all the sacrifice made by the troops during their advance on San Lo. These men are using a bomb crater as shelter. Got a machine gun set up. The rubble that Major Harry's body was laid on was the remains of the bell tower, which was this side of the church. See, there's no tower integrated on the church now. So they built a new one and they built it in concrete. One of the strangest vestiges of the war is on this tree just south of San Lo. They've put rungs in the trunk to make a ladder to go up to a lookout post. It's the only one I've ever seen like this. San Lo was bombed by 95%, although the figures can be uh, argued about. It's been rebuilt in concrete. There's Notre Dame down there. And the bombing started on the 6th of June in the evening. And this is the prison that was bombed. This is all that's left is the gateway. There were 76 resistance in there. Killed. And these are the names of the resistance who were either executed, shot, or deported. As San Lo was bombed, 
two reasons. One was it's a crossroads and so it was vital to capture it so they could move in all directions. And it was the headquarters of General Marks. This is General Marks headquarters. It was represented in the longest day. And the bunkers down there. Yes. Somebody's put a nice secure door on it. So you can't go in. Over there we can see the church in Notre Dame. Before San Lo could be rebuilt, it had to be demined and the rubble cleared. French deminers and German prisoners carried out the work. It took over 15 years to complete the reconstruction. The hospital at St. Lowe had been destroyed in the bombing. The Irish Red Cross helped build a temporary hospital. From 1947, donations were collected in the US to build a modern hospital. The Franco-American Hospital opened in 1956. It has this remarkable mosaic on the facade. <laughs>